Uh, Dr. Ferries is the co-director of the melanoma program at Angelus and has been a investigator and involved with the melanoma paradigm for as long as I've known him and before. Uh, so please come up. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, so I've, I've um, been in sort of the presentation uh, mode in, in various challenging situations before. I've, I've had to debate, uh, you know, sort of giants in my field and you know, this open debate. I've had to follow uh, Nobel laureates, you know, in their presentations. And um, I would say that th this is probably uh, the toughest act to follow. Uh, uh, the three people here uh, calmly, clearly elucidating various components of the meaning of life, and now you got me uh, coming up. Uh, and um, I guess I can just then learn the lesson uh, that they try to teach uh, in this in the last uh, segment, and just be, I guess, grateful uh, for this moment that I've been given. Um, and I think it is a, a, a great moment, and and hopefully. Uh, this talk, uh, which is uh, a, a sort of potpourri of um, interesting tidbits, I guess, uh, will hopefully uh, stimulate uh, questions and interest uh, for when we all are here to answer questions in the next uh, segment. So I'm supposed to cover what's next, and uh, the areas that Dr. Hamid gave me to cover are the microbiome, uh, your T cells, and then some lifestyle issues. And um, so uh, we'll hit those and talk about how the microbiome, um, the organisms that live with us and in us, how that relates to cancer in various ways um, and implications for some of the current therapies. Uh, some uh, information about T cells, some of which you've heard already that I'll uh, talk about a little bit again. Um, and then some issues about uh, prevention, about um, uh, the, the issue of smoking and the issue of obesity as it relates to, um, as it relates to melanoma. So the microbiome, as it turns out, we, this bag of whatever this is up here, is mostly not human. Uh, we're only about 10% human, and we're 90% other things. Um, and so if you look at that in terms of just the number of cells uh, that make us up, uh, or um, even more impressively, the number of genes uh, that are within us, it's mostly not person. Um, stuff. Uh, it's mostly the microbes uh, that live on us, that live in us. Um, and so it's not unexpected then that these things could have a huge influence on um, what happens to us over time. And uh, so there are microbes uh, that can cause cancer. Uh, so HPV will cause cervical cancer, head and neck cancers. Uh, H. pylori can uh, cause certain gastric cancers. Merkel cell polyomavirus causes a skin cancer called Merkel cell carcinoma, and the hepatitis viruses can cause liver cancer. Uh, so these microbes can be potentially dangerous, um, but they can also uh, help us. And so you've heard about some of the microbes that are actually being used as cancer treatments. And one of the oldest of these is uh, BCG. Uh, BCG is a TB vaccine. It's been around for a long time. It's used to treat bladder cancers, but we use it in some instances in melanoma as well. And I don't know if this projects very well, but this is the, the thigh of uh, one of my patients. And you may be able to just make out there are hundreds of little black dots there that are um, in transit melanoma metastases. Um, and so we actually injected uh, some of those with um, BCG. And the interaction of this organism with the, um, my patient's immune system led to lots of inflammation at the sites of the injections. Um, and we obviously couldn't inject all of these hundreds of spots. Um, but then they all went away. Uh, so this is her. The little black spots that are left are now just pigment. Um, and they disappeared. And it was this interaction uh, between the patient, her immune system, and the microorganism that we put in there uh, that essentially helped her get rid of uh, the melanoma that was there. Um, there are more modern versions of a uh, similar sort of thing. Uh, so the Coxsackie virus, you heard a little bit about. That's in clinical trials uh, now. And uh, another patient who had melanoma in transit metastases on his scalp. And now it's in combination. This is given in combination with some of the immune therapies that you get. 
And as with many immune therapies, it takes some time to get going. You see that his tumors grew actually over time. But then uh, he turned the corner and they all went away uh, and have stayed away. Um, and so uh, we don't understand how this interaction works uh, in any great detail, uh, but certainly for some patients, um, the, the organisms can, uh, can help get rid of things that we want to get rid of. It also affects uh, how our bodies react to the other therapies that uh, you get. And some of the main interest now is on how uh, the organisms that are part of our microbiome uh, influence how well people respond uh, to various therapies. And it's probably actually true of not just immune therapies, but chemotherapy and other things like that. Um, but specifically for some of the drugs that some of you have gotten, uh, for example, the PD-1 inhibitors, um, uh, they've looked at this. So this is a, a study from MD Anderson. There are studies from the University of Chicago that show very similar things. And what they did is they sampled uh, the tumor, they sampled the microbiome, the oral bacteria and the fecal bacteria um, uh, at, over, at various points during these people's treatment. And then uh, there are incredibly sophisticated ways now that they can look at the genetics, basically, of the bugs that are there to try and figure out at least what types of bugs, what categories of bugs are living in the GI tract and such. Um, and they can uh, sort of map that out uh, based on the genetics that they find in the samples. Um, and when they look at, um, this is a measure of the diversity of the bugs that are in the GI tract. Um, and it turned out that people that had a greater diversity, a greater number of different types of organism in the GI tract were more likely to respond to the immune therapies than people who had uh, sort of more simple, more um, less diverse um, uh, uh, organisms. And so when you plot out uh, the, this uh, survival curve, uh, the group that has the best survival that's at the top has this very diverse, very high diversity um, uh, set of organisms in their, in their GI tract. And so we don't really know how to act on that just yet, um, but there's additional research going on to try to sort that out. Um, and these are studies that are open, um, at least at the time this review article uh, was written, that try to get into how all this works. And so it varies from things as simple as um, adding a half a cup of beans a day to a regular diet um, and looking at what that does uh, in, uh, in the diversity of organisms in the GI tract uh, to things as, um, as sophisticated as uh, fecal transplants, uh, which are now used to treat certain infections, um, but they're looking at fecal transplants to see if you can take basically the bugs from uh, someone who responded well to immune therapy and give them to someone uh, who isn't responding well to immune therapy and see if you can uh, sort of goose the system uh, to get them into a response. Uh, so fascinating early on in, in how this is going, but it'll be interesting to see how this uh, works out over time. Lots of stuff we just don't know. Next up on my list, uh, on my agenda, are T cells. So you've heard a lot about T cells, and, and um, most of the immune therapies that you've heard about, that you've gotten, work through the T cell um, in one way or another and aid the T cell in, um, in fighting uh, cancer. Um, you've heard a bit about, from Dr. Daniels, about autologous tills. I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, modified T cells uh, that are being used in some clinical trials, and then uh, uh, another type of immune cell called dendritic cells that we're using in the context of a vaccine. So uh, TIL, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, our bodies are generally able to uh, identify melanoma specifically as an abnormal thing. And so the white blood cells can traffic in and get into the tumor, uh, but for what, one reason or another, they're not able to eradicate uh, the tumor. And so what happens in this TIL therapy is the tumor's taken out, uh, taken out of that immunosuppressive environment of the tumor. And um, you can look in there and you can see these immune cells that are in there that, that are just not up to the task. But you can take them and you can put them into um, culture conditions in a lab uh, where those immunos immunosuppressive effects are not there anymore and where you can support the growth of those immune cells. And they proliferate, they kill the tumor that's in the, in the Petri dish, um, and then you can take them and put them through a rapid expansion protocol, you identify the ones that can kill the melanoma cells, put them through this rapid expansion protocol uh, to generate billions of them, 
and then those can be given back uh, to patients uh, as an IV infusion. And there are various ways they can be supported uh, once they're given. It's a, not a simple thing to do, um, but it does seem to be effective in, uh, in some people, even if they've been resistant to other types of therapy. And it may also synergize with some of the immune therapies that, um, uh, that we have already. Um, and so um, that's being, uh, there's a trial open at Cedars now for, from that company, uh, Lion, uh, that's looking at specifically at that therapy. Um, you can modify the T cells. So one of the problems is uh, that that whole process takes a long period of time, and you can't always identify cells that are reactive against the melanoma. Um, and so um, this hasn't been enormously successful so far in melanoma. It's been very successful in uh, some of the lymphomas and leukemias. Um, but you can take uh, white blood cells, the lymphocytes, out of just the peripheral blood, so no need to resect a tumor, and, uh, and actually uh, alter those cells in the laboratory. So you can introduce uh, genetic material into them that causes them to be specific, to have a specific T cell receptor that can recognize tumor antigens uh, or what's called a chimer chimeric antigen receptor that's almost like an antibody um, and change the cell so it turns into a CAR T cell. Those cells then can recognize um, either a, a normal sort of presentation of uh, tumor-specific characteristics of the cell or an antibody-based recognition of something on the surface of the cell and kill those cells. Uh, so it's been very effective in lymphomas of certain types, those sorts of things. The challenge in melanoma is identifying the targets, and that's been uh, sort of the problem so far, um, but there's work ongoing to, to make that happen. The immune system and how it relates to cancer is a very complicated situation, and we certainly don't understand it in great detail. Uh, but one of the other components of this interaction are antigen-presenting cells or dendritic cells. They're the cells that um, educate the immune system. So they, they tell the rest of the immune system, the, the soldiers of the immune system, like lymphocytes, they tell them what to go after. Um, and so uh, another angle to take on using the immune system is to actually uh, use vaccines. And the goal of vaccines in general is to educate the immune system to have it recognize things that are bad for us and get rid of them. That's how it works for the flu and that's how it works for polio. And, and the, the thought is that uh, have it work the same way uh, to fight against uh, tumors of various sorts. And so um, we actually have a clinical trial that involves um, dendritic cells, these uh, professional antigen presenting cells. And the way this trial works is that a piece of the tumor is taken out. It's uh, destroyed, it's lysed, it's broken up um, in the lab so that it's not alive anymore. And then those fragments are put into yeast cell, empty yeast cell walls. And those turn out to be a very effective way of getting those tumor fragments, those tumor markers um, into these dendritic cells, into the antigen presenting cells. Um, and then those cells are collected and given back as a vaccine. Um, and so that trial is still ongoing, uh, and we'll have to wait and see uh, how well it does in, in trying to accomplish that goal. What else? Uh, so what about lifestyle, and, um, and, and uh, what parts of, um, uh, of everyone's lifestyle affect uh, both the likelihood of melanoma and uh, how we do, how patients do when they have melanoma? Um, and so three things to cover that I'll cover there. There are lots of other things to talk about. Uh, one is what do we know about prevention uh, for melanoma? Um, how does smoking affect uh, how patients do with melanoma? And then what, what happens with obesity? So in terms of prevention, uh, avoiding sun damage. That's 95 to 99% of it. Um, and uh, for patients that have an existing melanoma, um, they're absolutely at risk for getting additional melanomas. So even if you get through the, the, the first diagnosis and that's treated and taken care of, um, there's probably in the neighborhood of a 5 or 10% chance that any melanoma patient will get a second melanoma at some point down the road. Um, and so uh, to try and reduce that risk, avoiding sun damage is, is a, an incredibly important thing for, uh, for patients over time. That does not mean you can't be out and doing your normal things. It just means you have to be sensible, you have to be smart, you have to be careful about how you do that uh, so that you're protected and you're not getting additional sun damage. 
um, and that's through a combination of picking the right time of day to be out, uh, to be covered up if you can, to use the shade, and then to wear sunblock. Um, and uh, you'll know uh, that you're doing what you need to do if your skin basically stays the same color all the time um, and uh, you're not getting sunburns. Um, melanoma patients are also at risk uh, for non-melanoma skin cancers, and um, so we don't know a huge amount about uh, how to protect, protect ourselves from that other than avoiding sun. Uh, people are often very curious about nutrition and how that plays into the risk of cancer, and I would say, broadly speaking, we don't know. Um, that a lot of the things that we think make sense and should work, uh, things like high doses of antioxidants and things like that, um, don't work. Uh, and some are more harm than good. Uh, and I often re recommend that people who are interested in nutrition get their nutrition from food, uh, primarily. Uh, the one exception uh, that we know uh, that has almost certainly has some impact is vitamin B3. Um, and so this has actually been studied uh, fairly uh, well um, in a study led from the Melanoma Institute of Australia in Sydney. And actually, I think that the, um, the winner for longest distance traveled uh, to come to this meeting uh, is uh, Jonathan Stretch, who is Professor Stretch, is uh, uh, visiting, I guess, not specifically for the symposium, but from Sydney, Australia. Uh, but he was here today. Um, and this uh, study comes from his institution. And this is just uh, nicotinamide, uh, essentially niacin, vitamin B3, uh, that uh, is given 500 milligrams twice a day and um, decreases the risk of subsequent uh, non-melanoma skin cancers, for sure. We don't know if it affects um, melanomas. Uh, reduces the number of actinic keratoses. The effect only lasts while you're on it, so it seems to uh, go away once you stop uh, taking it, uh, but it's generally pretty well tolerated. Um, smoking, as it turns out, is bad for you. I know. <laughs> you heard it here first. Um, but it's specifically bad for you in terms of melanoma. So uh, in patients who are current smokers uh, who are diagnosed with melanoma, their risk for metastasis in their lymph nodes, which is in the table there uh, on your left, is about 30% higher um, if they're smokers than if they're not. Um, and when you look at long-term survival, uh, that's also reduced uh, in patients who are current smokers. Um, and it seems former smokers uh, actually do about as well as never smokers. Um, and so uh, quitting is a probably good, makes, makes good sense for a whole bunch of reasons, uh, but it also makes sense in terms of the melanoma specifically. Um, in contrast, obesity uh, is a mixed bag uh, for melanoma. So obesity has a lot of ill effects uh, for other diseases. Um, and, uh, and, and other cancers. In melanoma, it's a little less clear cut. Uh, so obesity is clearly related, at least in men, uh, to the risk of getting melanoma. Uh, so that's that uh, the uh, figure on the left uh, under men. Uh, all of the studies that were done, that's a, just a list of a bunch of different studies that were done looking at this question, and all the ones where uh, the, the line is to the right of that vertical line uh, indicate an increased risk of melanoma, so obesity, in men anyway, is related to an increased risk. In women, it doesn't appear that that's necessarily the case. We don't know why that is the case. There are a lot of interesting differences between men and women in terms of melanoma, and this just happens to be one of them. Uh, obesity also, in the lower right, obesity is also related to the thickness of the melanoma, so the, the risk characteristics of the melanoma, and obese patients tend to have higher risk, thicker melanomas. Um, and it may be because they're uh, undressed less often, um, but uh, for one reason or another, uh, they also present with worse melanomas. Um, but paradoxically, uh, it does not seem to impart an adverse effect on survival once you're diagnosed with melanoma. Um, and uh, the, the same plot there on the left are a group of studies, and this was the study that Mike Davies did from MD Anderson that combined a bunch of clinical trials for advanced melanomas and at least for patients who are getting immunotherapies and patients who are getting uh, targeted therapies, the obese patients did a little bit better uh, for reasons that aren't entirely clear. So it, it's defined in different ways. In, this, in both of these instances, it's defined by a body mass index of 30 or greater. Um, and overweight is uh, sort of the next category down of, uh, of, from obesity, and that has a less consistent effect. Um, 
but in that and then in our own uh, MSLT trial, um, which was uh, earlier stage patients, uh, the obese patients did a little bit better than the non-obese patients. Now, this is not to suggest that you go out and get obese uh, as a result of it, um, but it is a mixed picture. Uh, so um, uh, elucidating why this happens will be an important thing to do over time. So uh, just to br bring it all back together again, so the microbiome, these bugs that live with us and in us, are both our friends and our foes, uh, but they probably have important implications in how we respond to therapy. T cells are the army, and there are lots of different ways we're trying to get at uh, affecting them, using them to, uh, to fight melanoma and other cancers. And then lifestyle uh, prevention, incredibly important, and sun protection is the number one consideration there. Smoking, just say no. Uh, and then obesity, it's a mixed picture, an increased risk, an increased thickness, uh, but maybe not an adverse effect on uh, survival overall. So hopefully this has uh, stimulated some other thoughts that you might have about uh, some of these issues, about lifestyle, and we'll uh, get into addressing all those in the um, panel session. Thanks very much.